Amazing! It was great! Thanks to the travel notes, that was energetic, that was crazy, that was good! So welcome everybody, welcome to the 2021 Human Rights Film Festival Berlin. It's the fourth edition, welcome! Well, this is a hybrid on and offline festival, which is starting today and is running till the 25th of September. So hello, welcome everybody, of course, who's watching us now at home or from the office or everywhere else. You can stream us on YouTube or Zoom, of course. So yeah, I would like to welcome you again, of course, the beautiful audience. We had some nice conversations outside at the Atelier Gardens. We're here at the Bufa Studios, a space to build the future together and acting new story from Berlin here in Tempelhof. 
It's the oldest studio in Berlin. This is where film history was made. This place, for example, was famous for black and white movies, and the actress Marlene Dietrich, for example, was shooting right here in this studio. So, they, so today, the studio keeps its film's tradition alive, but is also, of course, developing into a place for mindfulness, activism, and showing documentaries. So this has a historic place, the Buffer Studios at the Atelier Gardens, perfect, of course, for a wonderful and important festival, the Human Rights Film Festival in Berlin. So what can you guys expect? First of all, this festival is initiated by Aktion gegen den Hunger for the third time with Save the Children as our main partner and for the first time also in cooperation with Amnesty International, the Center for Humanitarian Actions, as well as a variety of other organizations. So we will have more than 50 international guests. There will be one exhibition, maybe you have uh, seen the exhibition, I can of course recommend it, and we have a four-day conference. So you get the opportunity to watch 40 suspenseful, exciting, and fascinating documentaries by some of the most amazing activists. It's about, of course, their passion. They give us the insights into the struggle of democracy, freedom, equal rights, which is very important, and as well as the struggle against climate change and its effects. So, activists are fighting injustice, and that's what the Human Rights Film Festival stands for, and honors, of course. Also, it has an emphasis on feminism, which I like, of course, very, very much. So let me first quickly introduce myself. My name is Busa Chiam. I'm a journalist. I work for a different kind of radio station. Um, yeah, and of course, they deal with culture and politics. And it's my honor and pleasure to be your host for tonight for this opening ceremony, as well as the ceremony on the 25th of September. So first, where is he? Welcome, please, on stage, the CEO of Aktion gegen den Hunger and the founder of the festival. Give it up for Jan Sebastian Friedrich Rust. Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, dear national and international guests, um, I always write my speeches last minute, so I have to read. Um, sorry about that. It's, a re it's really a pleasure. It's our fourth festival edition this year, um, and, and I have a feeling it's, it's again reaching a new dimension. Of course, it's still a second Corona Times hybrid festival, but uh, it's, it's just a, a great location to be here. Um, a lot has changed since last year, and uh, fortunately uh, in the world, these changes have not all been, been positive, um, many of them quite negative. Last year, the number of um, people, for example, needing humanitarian assistance reached more than 240 million, which is a record number. And more than 800 people after a steady decline over 10 years today are, at, uh, are going hungry, uh, going to bed hungry every night again. So we are actually further away from reaching the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Last year, we had a conference here at the festival on the SDGs. Uh, than ever before. Um, so teams of Action Against Hunger, but also Save the Children, our partner, are working tirelessly across the world to change the situation. Um, and all of us will not give up until we reach a, a world without uh, poverty and hunger. If we reach that in our lifetime is, of course, a different question. Um, but I think it's important, and this year's festival is mainly fo uh, has a main theme on activism, as you know. And uh, I think it's important to realize that not only large organizations such as ours can, can bring change, but individuals can, can as well. Um, and one really outstanding example is Lujen Hatloul, who is an impressive example. She has been uh, fighting for women's rights for many, many years. 
and she has been arrested on several occasions for defying uh, the ban on women driving in Saudi Arabia, finally successful because it's been lifted. But she nevertheless has not been able to, or she's not allowed to leave the country at this time. Uh, and uh, we're therefore more than happy and honored to have her sister uh, later on to join us on stage, Lina, who will speak on, on her behalf. Um, throughout the next 10 days, uh, you will see, you'll have the opportunity to see many more really powerful um, activists. I've seen most of these films, and, and really I encourage you to, to go and see as many as you can. It's, it's really a, a, a wide selection of, of, of powerful stories and activists around the world. And we hope that, um, that they will inspire you, and even perhaps some of you uh, will want to become activists yourselves. Um, we, we could not be here today without our great partners. So I'd really like to thank Save the Children. Um, as, as you mentioned, our third uh, uh, consecutive year together in the festival. Thank you, Martina and Claudia, for the trust uh, and the patience uh, and also your support and, and input and, and participation in the festival. Um, I'd also, uh, again, like to uh, uh, welcome Amnesty International. It's great to have you on board. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense as a human rights festival. So in the fourth year, to have you on board for the future, uh, that's a great thing. Uh, and again, we have uh, our forum partners, Center for Humanitarian Action, as well as the Fund Center for Fundamental Rights of the Hattie School, and um, the support of the German Foreign Ministry, which uh, is uh, highly important for this festival, as well as the support of BMZ and GIZ, um, and two private foundations, which I'd like to mention, Schöpflin Foundation and Robert Boss Foundation. And of course, last but not least, the, the Buffa Atelier Gardens, which uh, offer us this original unique location. Um, so um, yeah, uh, not more to say than thank you also to the festival team, Anna, Lydia, I don't know where you are, if you're even in this room, somewhere busy, as well as everyone else from, from Action Against Hunger, Save the Children, volunteers who've been working to make this festival uh, possible. So uh, yeah, I thank you all for joining us today, and, and I really wish you an inspiring festival, and please give an line of exp uh, applause for, for the organizers uh, behind the scenes, because that's not me, so thank you. So nice, so nice. Thank you very much. I think half of the applause belongs to you, Jan Sebastian Friedrich Rust. So the next person, he already mentioned it, I would like to introduce to you is Lina Al-Hadlul. She's a lawyer and activist and the younger sister of Lujain Al-Hadlul, our patron by way of the festival this year. To give you a little bit of more background information, in May 2018, Lujain, Saudi Arabia's most prominent women's rights activist, was arrested along with more than a dozen other human rights defenders. She was detained for almost three years, so this day she has not been allowed to speak freely. She's a brave woman, she's a fighter, just like her sister, Lena. I talked to her, she's brilliant, she's such a big heart, so we are extremely happy. Lena is an amazing advocate for women's rights, Please welcome on stage Lina Al Hadlou. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. And thank you to the Berlin Human Rights Festival for choosing my sister Lujain as its honorary patron this year. Um, it has been seven months since Lujain was released from prison. But as my presence attests, she is not free and still silenced. My sister Lujain fought for Saudi women's basic human rights, including the right to drive a car, the right to be protected from domestic abuse, and the right to be emancipated from the male guardianship system. Because Lujain refused these injustices in our country, she has been through the unthinkable. My sister was kidnapped in March 2018 from the Emirates. She was handcuffed and blindfolded and flown back to Saudi Arabia against her will. Once in Saudi Arabia, she and my whole family were put under a travel ban. A couple of months later, the Saudi state security broke into our house and forcibly took Lujain. None of the men would say where they were taking our sister. 
My mother ran after them, begging them to give her any information. The last words she could scream were, please, at least, let me say goodbye to my daughter. In the days that followed, Saudi newspapers and official Saudi social media accounts started a huge defamation campaign. They were calling Lujain and all the other activists traitors and agents of enemy states. I did not really know what to think at that moment. It was too absurd for me to believe it was true. But Lujain had been disappeared. For more than three weeks, we did not know where she was. Nobody would answer our inquiries. And this is when our journey through hell started. The first call we got from her, Lujain told us she was taken to another city, Jeddah, and that she was in a private hotel, or the palace, as she would call it, but not in any official prison. She stayed there months, and no visits were allowed. In August, my parents were finally allowed to visit Lujain after she had been transferred to the official prison. My parents saw that she was shaking uncontrollably, unable to hold her grip, to walk or sit normally. Lujain, resilient as she is, first blamed it on the air conditioning and tried to assure my parents she would be fine. But after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in October 2018, several reports were leaked about detainees being tortured in hotels. My parents visited Lujain the month after. They asked her about these reports. And that's when Lujain collapsed in tears. She said she had been tortured in what she used to call a palace, which in fact was a torture center. My sister was held in solitary confinement, beaten, flogged, given electric shocks, waterboarded, sexually harassed, and threatened with rape and murder. My parents then saw that her thighs were burnt and blackened with bruises. Months later, Lujain was finally given official charges. And surprisingly, none of the false accusations were mentioned in the charge sheet. Lujain was officially accused of all her activism, being in contact with Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, demanding rights for women, participating in international conferences to speak about the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia, being in contact with EU diplomats in the country, applying for a job at the United Nations, and the list goes on. Although her charges were explicitly mentioning her activism, Saudi officials kept defaming her publicly. It went so far that the Crown Prince himself, Hamad bin Salman, said in an interview that Lujain is a traitor and that he has videos proving it. Videos, he said, he could show the day after the interview. Three years later, and nothing has been proven against my sister and all her fellow activists. Then the trial started, but kept being indefinitely and illegally postponed. Lujain was held in solitary confinement again, forbidden from preparing her defense, and for months, forbidden from any outside contact. She has been through two hunger strikes to pr protest the ill treatment they were deliberately subjecting her to. And their aim was clear. Lujain will have to be released, but they don't want her to be seen as a strong woman. They wanted to break her and terrify her before leaving her prison cell. In December 2020, Lujain was sentenced in the counter-terrorism court to five years and eight months and a five years of travel ban. Additional to the sentence, Lujain was placed on three years probation, which means she's forbidden from speaking on her experience in prison, of speaking about human rights in Saudi Arabia, or being in contact with journalists. So, after 1,001 days in prison, Lujain is not behind bars anymore, but she's held in a bigger prison that is called Saudi Arabia. And with Lujain's release, the situation in Saudi Arabia has not changed. Since Mohammed bin Salman came to power, the country has become a police state where fear is ubiquitous, where silence rules, 
and which, in which collective punishments have become the norm, including travel bans on families of activists. Our fight for rights and freedoms in my country is as crucial as ever, and this fight is crucial for our collective human rights globally. And each one of you can make a positive change. This is why the stories of human rights defenders like my sister Lou Jane and the stories of defenders and political pr prisoners all over the world need to be heard. We need to remember the cost that my sister and so many others have paid for freedom. Only freedom of association, freedom of thought and expression will allow for a better human rights situation in any country. For that, governments need to be challenged and pressured. So I call on you all to please challenge government's narratives. Listen to the people. Learn the stories of human rights defenders. Ask questions. Support popular initiatives such as the Saudi National Assembly Party. Most importantly, remember our heroes who have been fighting for a better country and who remain in pr prison, including Abdelaziz Ashbeli, Abdelaziz Al Ouda, Salman Al Ouda, Abdullah Al Malki, Abdurrahman Al Sathan, Hassan Al Malki, Walid Abu Al Khair, Khalid Al Amir, Mohammed Al Jadi, Mohammed Al Rabia, Asma Sbaye, Alina Sharif, and the list goes on. Finally, I would simply like to tell you here how lucky we are to have a voice and we can use it for just causes. Many of you have been vocal for the release of my sister, and without which she would still be in jail in unknown conditions and forgotten. So thank you all so much for your support, and please remember, the fight for human rights needs all of us, and it is not over as long as repressive governments continue to rule and oppress the people. Thank you. What an impressive speech. I've listened to it the second time, and uh, it's not giving me goosebumps. It's also, it's, uh, I'm losing my voice when I listen to what you say. So, <sighs> inhale, exhale. So, the next person I would like you to welcome on stage is the director of the festival. While she was developing the program for this year's festival, there was one quote which motivated her constantly. It's by Albert Einstein, and it goes like this. If I were to remain silent, I'd be guilty of complicity. Please welcome on stage with a warm applause, Anna Ramskoglavit. <laughs> There you are. Thank you so much. Good evening to everyone. It's my pleasure seeing a full cinema again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe first question, why did you choose that quote? That quote, I was reading, so we do a retrospective on Benjamin Ferenc, and I was reading quite a lot about him and about the time. And then I came across this quote by Albert Einstein, and I was like, he's so true. Uh, if injustice happens, and we all stay quiet because it doesn't affect us directly. We are part of the problem. So that's also what we want to reach by our film selection and through the festival, is motivate people to speak up, not just on their behalf, but also on the behalf of injustice that happens to somebody else, but also elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at the artistic concept. The Art of Change, what's special, what's important, what's maybe new? <laughs> so Jan mentioned quite a bit about that before. The Art of Change was uh, joined, uh, we came up to, uh, on it together with our partners, within our teams, we were like thinking, okay, we want to take about activists, activists, work for change, so what should be our motto this year? 
And then we also work with artists. And uh, to achieve change is an art, but also art plays a crucial role in achieving change. So there they all came together and we thought it sounds beautiful and it's very inspiring and positive. Mm -hmm. Plus there's an exhibition. Yes. Maybe you can say some words to the exhibition. Uh, so the festival has three pillars. We have 40 excellent movies. We have the conference that already was mentioned on storytelling and how storytelling can contribute to change. And so we also want to show other storytelling besides films that contributes to change. So we are showing 10 international, very different projects from photography to multimedia to virtual reality, which are all targeting completely different problems, but are showing the power of, power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. and they are all really beautiful, and you should go in the exhibition and watch them. It's worth it. <laughs> so I already mentioned it's a focus on feminism, um, something I know personally. It's a big thing for you, too. It's close to your heart. Can you um, yeah, put it in your own words why it's so important? There are many reasons why it's so important. I read, I read something quite interesting the other day. It was, only if we empower women and make them equal, we have a chance for a better, more just, uh, more peaceful world. And I think if you look to humanitarian aid, if you look to human rights, if you look into systems, how family works, everywhere where women are equal and people are equal, I don't think it's just about women being equal, it's about people being equal, we are a step further to a better place. And the second thing was we had around 400 films in our pre-selections and we had so many fantastic films about such brave women. Mm -hmm. um, also in our opening film tonight, we see really amazing, brave, breathtaking, brave mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's have a look at our international guests. Which are you most um, excited about? The most exciting about them is that they are here. Yeah. <laughs> we miss them. Uh, we have around plus 40 international guests. It's absolutely amazing that we have the director of our opening film here tonight. But I know there are other directors like Julian Scher in the audience. He is going to present Ghosts of Afghanistan tomorrow in the cinema. Uh, Lina joined us, which is outstanding and absolutely fantastic. So for me, the beauty is that we have the possibility to exchange our thoughts with that people and just start a conversation. Yeah, so maybe we should start a conversation with the filmmaker of the opening. Absolutely. Uh, Hoge, could you please join us on stage? Please give him a warm welcome. Hi. There he is. He's here. Again. Yeah, nice to see you all here. Yeah, it must be an exciting evening. Uh, you did this um, important, amazing film. Um, how is it for you that we will now see it for the first time all together here in Berlin? Yeah, it's very nice. Actually, the first time I'm in the screening to see the film with the, with the audience after 30 festivals now, either my first festival, I'm with the, with the audience. So I'm very happy and I hope you like the movie and uh, have questions for me after the movie. So, very excited. We are extremely thankful that you are here. Thank you for, for your beautiful, breathtaking, emotional uh, film, which also reminds us of our responsibility of a world society to not stay silent and to not forget that there are still so many women hold captive. Hoge will be back on us on the stage after the movie. Yeah. Uh, we will do a Q&A. You will bring a colleague of yours who also filmed with you. She will uh, translate for us. And please, despite this being the opening ceremony, if there are any very pressing questions, ask them. Uh, we will do a short Q&A, but please, let's celebrate this first screening of the film with an audience, with Hoge tonight. Yes. So. Yeah, it's the opening film of the Human Rights Film Festival, Sabaya. Thank you.
opening film of the Human Rights Film Festival. Well, I really have to say, I think this is one of my hardest jobs I've ever made to see this uh, documentary. This is the cruel reality. It's, um, yeah, um, I think we all feel a bit emotionally shaken after we've seen all this. And I think it's important that we speak about the film and um, reflect on it. And I'm very grateful that we have our director of the festival, Anna Ramskoglevit, and of course, the filmmaker, Hogir Hirori, here with us right now. So, welcome. I'd like to step in and introduce one more person next to me. Uh, she is not only translating for us today, <laughs> but she was also the researcher of the film and was uh, with Hogir on the location filming. So. Thank you so much for supporting us today in the translation, and thank you both so much for this important film. When I rewatched the film now, I was like, how did you make the film, and how are the people today? Um, like over the three films I have made as a feature documentary, this was the most difficult to be working on. Because meeting these women and listening to their stories changed my whole life. Uh, uh, many of them, I kind of know their stories before even I met them, and before they take this black out of their faces, there was something for me that I knew before. Yeah, they didn't know me, but I knew them, and I knew that um, I want to tell this story. How, if we look at the women and also at the men you are filming, there's lots of trust, and I always find it very fascinating, but also beautiful to see how filmmakers build up the trust. So, how you just told you know you knew the stories, but how was it when you first met them, and how did you establish this beautiful relationship? Um, I have to stop him sometimes, <laughs> although I know a lot about the story. But uh, Hugo is saying that uh, it was always about spending time. Uh, so he invents a lot of time in here by going there and many times like just putting the camera away because he wanted to present himself as human and as a friend and as someone who's like coming close to these people and to this story. Uh, the difficulty was that I always needed to go there with the whole crew and this was almost like impossible. So it was like about five to six trips that he had to make alone because it was very dangerous for the crew to cross the border, even from Kurdistan, Iraq to Syria, and to be there together. <laughs> Until he forced me once to go with him, <laughs> jumping in. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when I get it, I so sometimes the cameras was on like for non-stop for days and some other times it was almost off for days, so. Mm. 
Um, the last scene of the film is very, it has an investigative type, but it also shows the risk that the women are taking. So the time between you shooting the film and today, there, there was a year, more than a year mm -hmm. in between. So how are, how is the UCD Home Center doing today and how are the women doing? الهارد سبيك ومن تصوير كي حطوك وما خلاص كي في المديد قلا قلا كاريوانا بزح ما تربو روج بروجيم. It was like since he was his observation from the beginning of the filming and afterward it was becoming more and more difficult actually. جبر كودا عشان ريديتن كودا تشاوان كي تشاوان شيرن دي تشاوالي كان كوكاس وانا نبيندن. Because also ISIS people inside the camp they start finding the way how to hide the women, the Yazidi women more and more because all what the, this woman and the Yazidi uh, home center was doing, it's become more clear. Uh, so after we finished the filming, the Ziad, the Sheikh Yazidi Sheikh, he had to leave uh, Syria uh, forever because uh, he was always being threatened by ISIS group, but it's come to a moment that it's not possible anymore <laughs> to stay there. <laughs> uh, he went to a place like completely outside Syria to uh, be safe. Yeah. Mm. And it's become even like more difficult for the Yazidi uh, home center because uh, as we know for, for now, like after this, they only could have saved six or seven more girls. So if we take, uh, talk about the situation currently, when we spoke before and when you gave the interview for our program, you mentioned mm. that there are still thousands of girls and women who are captive. How could we save, how could we support the Yazidi saving these girls? Do you have like a feeling of what would be needed and what needs to be done? Bohundi at Bijam Dustin Master Pedven, Dowletted Master Pedven, Hekam Dorat Master Pedven, Daspe Bikan, Boris Gorkinavan Kicha, you had a green cow. I think it's more important to have many uh, bigger involvement in this. We need uh, real, like really big governments to get involved in this, uh, big organization, and uh, not only individual. And if individual activists at the ZD home with some cell phones and connection and really small weapons can save all these lives, then that means government and organization can do much more. Uh, uh, there was a lot that have been told about this woman, but really very small that have been done. Um, if your film has traveled to over 30 festivals and you are telling this story and I think everyone in the room agrees completely with you that we need to act now. Did you have a feeling that it, more reporting on the issue, more news, more publicity saying there are still these women in there would challenge other governments, international governments to act on their behalf? Uh, he wished that this could be happened. Oh. Yeah. I also wanted to do this documentary, so nobody said that we have never heard or knew about this. As Jiano Khodahami, Penobar Bum, Ravio, Mas Sharditna, Bas Mohaban, Widamido, Nina's Nisha Kasakib Nambijim Avachewa, Halik Bornaka Jiochewi. I have spent my life myself like escaping in as a refugee and in that time uh, nobody told this kind of stories and now it's different. Uh, what was happening now was happening even then. 
like from kidnapping women, uh, women or kids or killing men, everything was happening also in my time. Ava had nafsi tishte chet bi tan jara kadim chet bi ta bavrukya. O av dokumet shna sivit ke mala bi katan ko jara kadi shna bi tava. So everything happened with me and happened then. It's happening again and again now. And what I wish when I make a documentary that it will not happen again in the future. I think your documentary takes a very strong stand on that. What I would like to do as we are an open forum, uh, we have over there a microphone. If anyone feels like a question burning in their chest or wanting to ask something to Hogir as he leaves tomorrow, that's your chance now. Otherwise, I have two or three more questions. I know it's spooky at first, but it's really a beautiful opportunity, so please take it. Is anyone moving? Yeah, there's a question. I like that. Hi. Hi, hi, my name is Sonia, and first of all, thank you so much for this absolutely amazing thank and heart-touching story. Um, my question would be probably about something that is a topic for another movie. Uh, meaning the, um, the next part of the girl's life. The center rescued several of them, 206, as far as I remember. Uh, some of them were brought back to Sinjar. How are their families accepting them? How are they integrating? They haven't seen their families for such a long time. What is happening to mm. them? Do you know any stories that follow? Yes, mm. um, uh, هر از دست پیکه دوخته که چهارت این گرتن شیخین و آنها دیان کسی دینداری تو آنها بریارد و کو افکت چه دویت وگر نبا و دویتن هر دو دسته خو اما آنها به لگیری نو و خدام بکین و جاره کدی. The decision was made when uh, in the beginning this happened that the, all the sheikhs of the Yazidi religion in uh, Shingal they decided that no matter what happened this woman should go back and we should hold them in both hand and have them back. بس تشتی از دیا حتی اگر که قابل نکری جبر کو گروپی که گرتیه بدست یعنی همه گواهی از دی شیپی از دیا دکان دیانا تو خود ات گرد گرتی نه نیت قامیت تو خود ات گرتی نم. It's the thing is in the same time that the Yazidi religion it's very closed and it's not an open religion and it's not an open ethnic groups. اما جرای کیا دیانا تو آن دچار بیتن کو کسای که نه از دی بیتن هر چه آب ریکا که اقتصاد باید که نه زارو کارش که چنی از دیا چه کتن و آو زارو it's the first time they, they also uh, have to face this reality that now there is the kids that have been there, but they have a Muslim father, they have uh, ISIS father, and that can, and this is why they cannot be accepted in the Yazidi religion. And it's also about the civil law in Iraq, which is do not accept that to have a kid who uh, is a Muslim uh, kid, son of a Muslim uh, father, to be raised by another uh, family, which is not a Muslim family. But the Kurdistan Iraqi organization is in the Harikari of Wank Chatkan, the Bishans of Serbia, the Hobbigan. The Gallic is one of the Jonah Hoda Chuna, and the Jonah Gallicotia Garden. In Kurdistan, Iraq, there is many uh, organizations that are supporting this woman and helping them to go uh, forward with their life. Uh, it is very difficult and complicated, but they are trying to uh, go ahead with it. Leila, what film did you make a card for the clinic that you have a receptionist? Yeah. Uh, Leila, for example, the woman you met in, uh, like you saw in the film, she's working on a, uh, as a reception uh, girl in a uh, clinic. Mm. And now she's in love. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Uh, Welcome. Are there other uh, questions in the room? Otherwise, I would have a closing one. As also, any questions? You feel free, really. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Hi. Um, Hi. 
Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for thank the you. movie and uh, for that you are here today and answering our questions. I have really one question about the child and about the children. There was uh, 24, I say, uh, or more than? 52. Oh, 52, mm. yes, thank you. So what happens um, mm. with kids? Uh, I yeah, uh, there is a specific uh, orphan, now mm. this is how they call it, in Northeast Syria, uh, that's where all these kids are there. Uh, many parties are trying to find a solution for this and find uh, any way to know the future of these uh, kids. But unfortunately, till now there is nothing. Uh, uh, but I'm kind of optimistic that something will happen because it's like the most hurted people in all this are these kids and those women, so there must be a solution. Uh, one of the people who never gave up on this uh, issue is Ziad himself because even now from outside Syria, he's trying to work on this issue. So th is there some chance that the child will be with the mother in the future? Uh, the whole discussion is now about to having the gathering of mother and kids in a third country because in Iraq it's impossible because they are, by the end of the day, sons of uh, Daesh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. I think that was a very important question. So I think the film was, otherwise we wouldn't have selected it as opening film, is very strong and very emotional. But now I want to ask a completely off film topic, emotional question. How was it for you to see it the first time as an audience? Gala Jura da Silman Rajafin, Manazan is Bercha, Manazan in Massar, we are in Berko film, but Bumi Hasako Galako Harib was not for the Babin and Filmy. He was like hands shaking many times and he was not sure is it cold or what's going on, but he was just feeling too much that he's surrounded with people. Gala Gala Spos, Kuhamil Filminari. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here, and thanks for you, Anne. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here, Hoge. Thank you so much for your support, really. Thanks you swear. made the day. Uh, thank you so much for being here in the room, for watching this difficult but so important film. Uh, we do have uh, the possibility to continue our talk outdoors. Uh, there will be... Um, drinks and food and a good atmosphere and they even lit a small fire so you won't be cold and I think it provides a beautiful space that we can talk about the film, possible solutions, how we could challenge governments uh, to change the situation. Thank you so much, Thank Holger, you. and please Thank give him know. a warm...